Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got the man Mountain Island Lord. How's you doing? How are you, brother? Thank you, thank you very much, James. First of all, thanks for letting us come into your house and coming on the podcast. My pleasure. I appreciate it. Yeah. So you've got a very interesting life, spent over 30 years in prison, one of the biggest riots, the biggest riot in British history, 25 days in strange ways, on the roof, causing mayhem, but it's good to see you've changed in your life, you've wrote a book, which we'll touch on, you're getting documentaries out, and now you're trying to get a film into it, so yeah, you've got a lot to touch on, so I always go back to the starts of my guest, and uh, where you grew up, and how it all began for you. That's fine, yes. Hey, my group. A Manchester lad myself, um, at one and a half years of age, because of a terminless um, lifestyle with my parents, I was placed in the care of the local authorities at one and a half years of age, um, up to the age of 10. So I was moved around a lot between children's homes, foster homes, etc. Um, and eventually, when my father come to collect me when I was 10 years of age, I was in Liverpool then, so the Scouse twanger come out, or t- you know, I got a stick for that last time. <laughs> um, but um, I couldn't relate to my parents because there was that no connection, you know, nature, nature or nurtured. Um, and as a result of that, I kept on running away from home. Um, I was apprehended by the police on numerous occasions, given a slap on the wrist. But eventually, because of my behaviour, I was placed back in um, children's homes. Um, and the last children's home that I was discharged from, because I was 16 years of age, was Mobley Boys School in Wimslow. Um, and that's when my life began, so to speak. Um, not necessarily on the right track, but it began. Um, I came back home to my parents, um, but I was quite outstandish with him and I was quite rebellious in certain respects. Um, I banded with the other lads on the estate. Um, and like young teenagers, we got up to a lot of mischief. Um, being mischievous, adventurous at the same time, which led to petty things, more or less. But unfortunately, these petty things that were taking place, when I say petty things, I mean like going in shops and taking a fruit off the stands, you know, and climbing in through shop windows, you know, um, stealing stupidity, stupid stuff. Um, and numerous occasions I came to the police's attention. But again, slap on the wrist. Um, and eventually I left home but I was a bit like a nomad because I used to live with my friend, my sister, my friend, my that sister. Home, homeless? More or less Honestly. homelessness, but yes and no, because I still had a roof under my head, regardless, over my head, I should say. Um, but it wasn't the lifestyle to live or be healthy with, to be perfectly honest. Um, and eventually, um, I banded with a couple of lads on the estate because now I was living in Cheetah Mill. Um, and in one, one particular um, friend of mine, bless him, he died, was Kane. Um, I met Kane when he was in Mobley. And that's how we became friends. In the later years, I, I met with him again in Cheetah Mill. So we just had that instant connection. Um, but he already had friends in Cheetah Mill. And as a result of that, um, we banded, but it wasn't that type of like, Pali Pali, and it resulted where we went out to commit a robbery, not necessarily planned on the spur of the moment, I knew nothing about it, to be perfectly honest, uh, I'll never forget, it was um, January 1981, um, I was sat in the house watching the um, Dukes of Hazard, believe it or not, because outside was freezing, it was cold, I didn't want to move from the comfort of the home, and that was Kane's house, I was living with Kane at certain times. And um, Kane came in and said, yeah, you want to go and do a robbery? And at first, my reaction was, oh no, it's cold out there. Forget it, mate, I'm not interested. Um, but he played on my conscience. He come down us again. And my conscience got the better of me and my loyalty. And I went, okay, let's go. Met with the other blokes. Uh, we walked up to um, Wilton Polygon in Cheetah Mill. 
and it, it, it resulted in two proprietors closing the jewelry shop, both going their separate ways. And my expectations as a teenager, I had expect, expectations as a teenager, it was like, oh, he must have something in the case. Um, end up where we followed him. And it wasn't my intention to actually become involved in any type of physical confrontation. Even though I had a knife on me, that knife was on me from, for a different purpose, to be perfectly honest, because here you had two secular societies. You had Cheetah Mill, you had Salford. And at that particular area, there was a lot of racism. And there's a road that separates these two estates, so to speak. And it's called Waterloo Road. And on two occasions, I was walking up Waterloo Road. Cars pulled up. Young lads got out, same age as myself, with various forms of weapons. And obviously, we were intent on doing serious damage to myself and Kane. And twice we ran. Now, on the third occasion, occasion it happened, Kane didn't want to run. But I said, we have to run because they're going to give us a good idea and possibly, you know, uh, maim us. Um, but from that point on, and it was foolish of myself, to be perfectly honest, um, I said, I'm going to buy a knife. I'm not going to run no more. I'm not buying a knife for the purpose of committing any serious injury, but to ward off. Just yeah, more than anything else. Um, but that type of incident never occurred again because... The last thing I did with that night was put it in my Parker coat and forgot about it. And it was only when we were going to do this robbery on the shop that I just happened to pick that coat up. And I could say two proprietors went their separate ways. And as one was walking through Wilton Polygon, um, I remember going up to him and, and systematically, as I tapped him on the shoulder, I just took the knife out. And I, my, my words were to him, give us the brief. But before I finished saying give us the brief case, he started fighting with me. And I completely forgot about that in my hand. And, you know, throughout the scuffle, throughout the fight, you know, um, and he was giving me a good item. At the same time, don't get me wrong. Um, we fell down a couple of times because of the snow, because the ice. Um, and it resulted that he received two stab wounds. Unbeknown to me, that I actually stabbed him. Um, the last thing I recollect, I can't say his name, last thing I rec recollected the victim um, as I was exiting Wilton Polygon was him brushing himself down. So that gave me no indication that I'd done anything. And it was only later, as the evening was drawing in, that it came on the news. And I put two and two together. So panic mode set in. Um, I was still on the estate, but ducking and dying because the police were after me now. Um, and eventually, they did apprehend me. So how did you feel when you found out that it died? How was that? To tell you the truth, right, I, I, I was frightened. You know, there was nothing, nothing to glorify in it. I was frightened. My actions were foolish. I had, I had no intention of, of actually killing anybody. Intentions of, you know, like, warning off. Look, I've got a weapon. Don't do anything, you know. Um... But I was frightened, but at the same time, I was, I was, I was a bit sad and remorseful because I thought, what have you done, Al? You know, um, and I knew that my fate had been sealed, you know, for whatever period, though, I didn't know at that specific time, but I knew I was going away for a long time. Um, Did you go on the run or anything at that point? At, at, that, at, that, at that specific time time i was on the run for two days but i was still in the same area ducking and diving yeah, you're not a young boy you don't i was I, I you know i was i was young i didn't have finances i didn't have connections to get out from the estate i didn't know where i was going you know so it was like my head was up my ass um and eventually the police did apprehend me um on the saturday it was they apprehended me and um, they just sat up and see me ducking and diving but coming down the street towards them while they were all hiding, and then they just pounced on me. What um, was that feeling like when you got charged with murder? Um, I was like numb, numb to just be, blank. yeah, numb. Um, 
you're going through a lot of motions, to be perfectly honest, you know. Like I say, you're anxious, you, you're sad about the situation, you wish you, you wish that you could reverse the time, you know. Um, you, you, you're fearful of what's to come. Um, but like I said, your face, it's sealed yeah. and you can't change nothing. Obviously, when you're rebellious and you're, you do all these petty crimes when you're younger, it is a case of, it can stem from a lot of abandonment issues, you hang around with the bad boys because you're kind of getting that sort of family feeling and love where you want to fit in because you don't get it in the house. Mm. So you want to do the bad stuff and then obviously when something is bad it happens like that, then that's when it all hits home and you go, fuck. Do you know what I mean? So when you first went, was that the first time you'd ever been in prison? No, I, I, I've, I've actually done two bar stores, two detention centres, two bar stores. But in comparison to this, it was on petty stuff. Yeah. You know, uh, it doesn't detract from the fact that it was, it was petty. It was still crime, but on the lower level, um, steam cars, things like that, etc. cetera. Um, but going to prison for a lengthy time in comparison to going to detention centre for six months and Borsal for nine months, yeah. there's it's no comparison. Day, yeah. you, you can't correlate it together because there you've got a realistic date of being released. Whereas being sentenced to life imprisonment, you haven't got a realistic date, you know. How um, was that at court then? How long did the trial run for? The trial lasted for um, four days, exactly, to be perfectly honest. Um, sure. but, but I knew my fate was sealed. I, I, I couldn't, no matter how I presented myself, and I was only a young lad, so I tried to present myself to the best of my ability, you know. Um, I was quite shocked by the fact that, you know, the first time I seen the photographs of the victim in the morgue was when I was stood in the stand. And that sort of like, you know. Makes it real? It may, well, it does make it real, but it sort of, it stuns you to, to see a victim laying prone on the morgue table you know, mm, not necessarily butchered by me, but butchered by the people who are doing the autopsy. Yeah, it makes it 10 times worse, but you, you're aware that the jury are looking at these photographs and all, and you, at the same time, you feel so, so embarrassed that you want to crawl into the ground because you know you've done a terrible thing here, but you, you, you can't change it. No matter how much you, you, you plead, how much you present your case, you've done you've done a serious crime, so you have to pay the price. Yeah. There's no way out of it, you know. And you, you can often offer all the apologies, which I do. You know, I regret what happened. You know, I resent what I've done. You know, um, like I said, if I could turn the time, that wouldn't happen. But you can't turn time. Of course, hindsight's um, a great thing. Absolutely, um, and. It affected a lot of people, not just myself. Yeah, and I always touch on that. Everything has a ripple effect. Not of only course. does it affect. It's not just about me. Yeah, it it's about it's about you know like the the, the victim and his next of kin. Yeah. You know who I, who I do feel sorry for. You know. Um, and also your family do the sentence with you as well. My family were affected, etc. The people in the court were affected. No. The juries, because they need to see yes. all the photos. And again, I, I, that's why for anybody watching or listening, I know uh, crime is on the rise, drug-related deaths are on the rise, and people to look in, big, strong man as yourself, very well connected to show the empathy and the sadness and all the apologies, yes, it's there, but mentally it can, um, it's always going to be there. It's, it's never going to go. And anybody that says, oh, um, I dismiss it, I, I can switch off it, they're, they're telling you lies. Yeah, they're blanking it out. Yeah, you know, because, you know, but they're living on our egos because we're all human beings. We've all got emotions. Yeah, we're all sensitive. You know? And for somebody to say, well, I don't feel nothing whatsoever. Well, if you really believe that unequivocally, then that tells me you're social path, psychopath. Yeah. There's no question about no it. No emotional feelings you know? or anything. Yeah. You know, so... You, you, you're still a human being and if you're a human being you will have them emotions of course and we've all got we've, we've all got all sorts of different kinds of emotions and then um, the people who try and block it out is the ones I believe are hurting the most yeah. because they don't want to face it but you faced it and then at, was it 19? were you 19? what age were you? 19 19 so then you go to the big boys leagues where yes. it's a different ball game from Boston how was that feeling walking in? was it 
Strange Ways and you went into very first time? Um, went to Strange Ways, but you, you, you have to differentiate between Strange Ways and the dispersal system. Right. Different ball game, dispersal right. system. What's the difference? Right, the difference is, is that your local prisons, i.e. Strange Ways, um, it's where a lot of people are doing a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Short term. You know, short termers, you know, a lot on remands, going to be dispersed. Whereas when you go to the dispersal system, they've been sentenced already. Some people in there are doing 30, 40, 50 years indefinite life, you know, in for very serious crimes. They don't care who you are. You know, but they, you know, you could be the, you could be the dumb. They're not interested in who you are when you walk in there. You know, you, you're on the same footing as anybody else. And if you try to kid yourself that you have to, you don't have to walk the line, then you're not going to survive because you will be dealt with. Because the minute you show any disrespect in any form or manner, even just looking at somebody wrongly, it's a confrontation. You know, and I know that because when I first went in, the first prison I ever went to, they had seven dispersal systems, prisons, get myself. Um, and I started off in Wakefield. And at that time, I wasn't that happy with Wakefield. It was classified as Monster Mansion. Or the Beasts and Peter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't get me wrong, you had straight lads there and all, but you only had a minority when the majority were the other ones, the wrong ones. So it was a bad atmosphere. And um, the straight lads always stuck together. But I was in a lot of confrontations with the system there because I wasn't entirely comfortable with it. Um, and eventually I was dispersed out to a prison where I was comfortable. You know, not under the right circumstances, but nevertheless, I was moved. And I'm not saying it, 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 everything from that point went perfectly fine. It didn't. Because from the onset, when I was in Strange Ways, um, on my man this was, my first day, um, I was placed on the segregation unit. And not just myself, but Kane. And as we were walking across the main foyer, um, unbeknown to us that the screws are set, their own psychological rule. Don't walk across the main floor on the fire, walk adjacent to the wall on the two tiles. And as we were walking across the floor, we were getting a barrage of abuse, you know, derogatory abuse and general abuse. And I know it sounds like laughable, but I didn't think it was directed at myself or Kane, but it was. Kane was placed in the cell on my left just as you enter more or less, a couple of feet along. And then I was taken right to the end in the seg, segregation unit, that is. And um, as I was entering the cell, a screw came behind me and punched me in the back of the head, said, you murdering black bastard. Um, and the door was shut. And I was only young, you know, and um, I was going through a lot of motions then, toppled on top with the fact that I'd just been placed on my man for a serious crime. And... It wasn't my intentions to get any type of confrontation with anybody in the system. Didn't even enter my, my thought, to be perfectly honest. Um, but as a result of him doing that, I had the butterflies, I was anxious, I was scared. That when the fight or flight mode kicks in where you either sit Absolutely. back and take well, I couldn't, I couldn't. I knew I couldn't flee. Yeah. There was only one way out of that cell, Just and that fight. was the door. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, but something else in me went... If this is the way it's going to be, so be it. And next time that door opened, I came out fighting, you know, despite the numbers. Um, was that the start of it for you then? And that's how it spiraled out of control. Yeah. Yes. When you just go toe to toe, yeah. don't take any shit. No, because for the next, from that point on, from the next, for the next 13, 14 years, it was me in the system. So when you got life, was that 15 minimum? I got, no, life means, life means 99 years you get a tariff. All life is get a tariff. Let me explain this. Right, because England is different from Scotland. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I wish I could have gone to Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in England, when you receive a life sentence, automatically on your prison record, it says 99 years. But every, every respective life it gets a tariff. And a tariff is set by the judicial, i.e. the judge. And what that entails is that he's, second, he's setting the tariff based on retribution and deterrence, hypothetically, because crimes still take place once you're sentenced. Um, but 
you know you're going to serve up to that point, whether that be a tariff of 10, 15, 20, 25 years, 30 years, you have to serve up to that tariff because he's made that recommendation. Once you reach that tariff period, then it becomes executive decisions whether to release you. That's where your problems begin. Because you're not being released on your tariff. No life has ever been released on his tariff in history. Um, and you're dealing with faceless bureaucrats. Is that good behaviour kick into play and other stuff like that? Does it not matter? Well, yes and no. I mean, I know life is that. I've, I've, I mean, I've got a friend in Newcastle at the moment and he got released from about two years ago. And he's uh, 29 years and he done everything by the book, but he still served 29 years yeah. above his tariff. So, and as he used to say to me in his correspondence since I've been out, I mean, to the point he got released, he said, I feel like I'm going mad here, Al. As you got to hold it together, mate. I know you've done everything, you've done every course, every, every requirement, you can't do no more. But as I said to him, it's just a game. So just play the game with him. And eventually got out. What did Kane get? Um, my core cues, um, there's five of us. Um, two of them got three, one got three and a half, Kane got five. And you got the life. Right? I got the life. And that's where it all, you started to realise, right, I need to fight back. Is that when you had to grow up fast, become an adult? So how did it, how did you get through the sentences? Because I know you've had a couple of escapes also. And then the, obviously the riots, you'll be rebellious, you wanted change. And the riots that you did mm. do, did get change yes. eventually. How far were you into your sentence once you started the riot in the chapel? Um, then I'd serve between 10, 10 and a half years then. Um, so or, even though the 10 and a half years, because I know you've done 15, but then your sentence, you ended up doing 32. Yes, another 17 years. So at the 15. 10 and a half, were you not thinking to yourself, I need to keep my nose clean? Or were you at that stage where you couldn't give a fuck? I wasn't really bothered, to yeah. be perfectly honest, because I still knew at that, that stage I wasn't going anywhere. And I knew as a result of that, not just my behaviour, but that incident, I sealed my fate for a long time. You know, so I, I wasn't kidding myself. I like to be a realist. Um, was there a part of you scared coming out as well? No, on the contrary, no, to the contrary, that, no, no chance. You know, and when you're in there, I mean, for all the years that I was inside prison, I never had a television, radio, never had own comforts, wasn't interested, slept on the floor. Slot them out. Um, had to slop out like anybody else. Why is that? Um, well, for the first 18 months that I was in prison, i.e. Wakefield, um, I had the comforts, don't get me wrong. And then on a particular day, I just thought, I don't want none of this. I don't want pictures on my walls. I don't want the quilt, in other words. I don't want that steady old system. I don't want it. You know, that doesn't make my life any better. And even though I had them comforts, I'd still been in confrontation with the system and down the segregation unit on numerous occasions. Um, so what I'd done, I just went, right, packed it all up, threw it in a sh sheet, dragged it out myself, threw all the railing onto the safety net. And um, I remember shouting out, anybody wants that, take it. And I walked back into an empty cell. And that's how I lived from that day on. All I had was my prison clothes and my few um, possessions in the bottom, I ate my toiletries. That was it. And whatever book I got. For 32 years? That's how I lived. Fuck's sake, Alan. That's how I lived. I used to, I took the bed frame out, everything, slept on the floor. Did people think you were losing your mind? Probably, yeah. I mean, it was never put to me. Um, I, had, I, had, I had people objecting to the fact, I excuse objecting to the fact that I'm not complying with the regime, but I was complying with the regime. Was that because you didn't want to accept anything from the system? I didn't want nothing from the system, correct. You know, I want to show them that I don't want nothing from you where you can't take anything from me. You know, because um, you've got to remember everything in the system, with the exception of visits um, and letters, everything else is a privilege, which can be moved like that. They can try and break you from the outside, but you don't want them to break you from the inside. No, correct. Mm -hmm. um, I want to show that I'm in control, regardless. And um, I carried that forward to the day I was released, even in open prison. So for 32 years, you, you did all that? Yes. To try and... That takes some going. It does, it does, but 
you, you know, you set, you set yourself in that mold, you know. I mean, some people from the outside, I, mean, I, had, a, I had a friend from um, Chicago, Jerry Scalise, he was serving 15 years. And um, when he seen how I used to live, he said, you know, how do you live like that? You know, you ain't got the basics in your cell, you know. And years down the line, when I passed through a prison, um, I had a conversation with the governor and she used to be a nun. And when she seen myself, she said, even as a nun, I had more in that room what you got in your cell. I know well, the racial abuse for yourself was bad. Was that one of, the, one of the main points that you didn't want to take it anymore? You didn't want to accept it? I wasn't prepared to there? put my head in the sand for anything, regardless, despite the odds. And we are talking about the odds in prison because, you know, you, you're dealing with the system here. And I'll be perfectly honest with, honest with you. Anybody that thinks that going into the prison system that they're going to beat it, you're not going to beat it. You know, you've got to be prepared to make sacrifices you know, because that's what it comes down to, because they're a lot bigger than you. And, and how can I put it? For the first number of years, it was fisticuffs with him. A lot of fisticuffs. And don't get me wrong, there was, there was many, many moments when it hurts, but I wasn't prepared to show it to them, that, you, that you'd hurt me, you know, because at the end of the day... Did that annoy them even more, though? Yes, yeah. That spurred them on to say, you bastard, we're not having none of this. Oh, but to grit your teeth... Because, the, because I've been in certain segregations when lads are being attacked by the Mufti team and they're screaming. And, and a couple of lads used to get irate about it and said, don't give them the satisfaction in your screen, which is true. Because it's a, we're all human beings. We all feel pain. We all bleed. But there's certain situations where you have to uphold your resolve and think, nah. But it was ruthless back then, the beatings, the 80s, oh, 70s, the 80s, 90s. As a boy actually in Scotland last week, you just get beaten to death by the screws. Ruthless, you know believe I mean? me and you, you know. I've always said that... Was there a lot of... Did they kill a lot of people in there from beatings? Well, there's, well, there's a book out. Many, many years I read it, and it was called Frank for My Life. And it's about all the deaths in prison that have taken place. You know, um, circumstances surrounding the deaths. But when you read it, you, it's too obvious. Um... But if you're looking throughout history, the British prison system, and uh, not one prison ward has ever been killed. Not one. There's one prison um, works screw being killed, but not one prison warder. But in comparison to all the prisoners who have been killed. Yeah, there's a lot of death swept under the of carpet. Of course, of course. Um, but the act, they can be brutal. Believe me, and you, brutal. I mean, I've experienced it. I know about it. How close a uh, death were you from beatings? Um, I'd say the worst one, the worst one that they ever done to me, although I, I can separate them, is he, he, beyond me because they all kind of the same. Was there that many? Gratuitous, oh, believe me, you could be here all week telling you. Yeah. Um, but when people read the book, they'll, they'll see it for its entirety. Um, but um, I remember that time when I was passing through um, Whitemore, and um, it, was over, it was over people wearing their own clothes, but I didn't wear my own clothes. But they wanted to come in and take this T-shirt off me. But it wasn't a personal T-shirt, it was theirs. I think they just wanted a confrontation. So they came in, multi-team and all that, we're having it out. And um, as a result of that, there was water on the floor because the sink had been broke. And um, he, he had a ledge just under the doorway and it was filling up with water at the same time all this is going on. We're in there for a good 15, 20 minutes having it out. And then when they've got eventually got me down, apprehending me, they were trying to hold me head under that water. I knew what they were up to, but look, because I'm a strong bloke, I was able to get out of it. What were you then at your strongest? Um, well, I've been fair, these forms of weight in prison. Yeah. So, so if my weight goes up, down, up, uh, down, uh -huh. you know, depending on the circumstances. Did you build yourself up so big as well so you could fight back? No, that had nothing to do with it, to be perfectly honest. No, no because when I first went to prison, I must have been around about 12, 11 stone. You know? Fuck's sake, man, so, that's tiny, huh? So, precisely. Uh -huh. So, size, size is irrelevant. It's what's in your heart and mind yeah. that counts. Um, but it enabled me to get out in certain scuffles with him to make him back off. 
you know. Um, but when you're outnumbered, you know, eventually your engine's going to give in. You're fighting a lost cause, though, aren't you? Of course you are. You can fight as much as you want, mm -hmm. you know. But as I used to say to them, I used to say to them, they're all stood there in the right gear, whatever. Well, this separates the man from the mice then. Let's go for it. <laughs> That's all I need to say. Uh -huh. And some of them must think, well, he's bloody right there. Look at all of us. Is that your buzz as well, though? Because you hadn't fuck all in yourself, did that kind of get you through it? Just fighting back and give you a wee bit of purpose because they were trying to Kept break me alive. you so much? Yeah. Kept me alive. And the reason why I say that, because when I went to Hull in the 90s, psychologists asked me the, asked me the, the question that nobody's ever asked. She says, does your anger and by all the conflicts you've gone through in the prison system, do you think that kept you alive? And I went, yeah. Yeah, your therapy. I went, yeah. I said, because it kept me stimulus going, me adrenaline going, you know, and the mere fact that you moved me from one establishment to the another establishment. I'm not stagnating all them years in one cell. I'm being moved around. As crazy as it sounds, if you didn't do that, then they've won. In your mind, they've won. If you stop fighting against them, they've won. And then for that, that's of course, you start of course. breaking you, you, inside. You've succumbed to their, 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 their rules and regulations. Their whims, yeah. yeah. And, and I wasn't prepared to go to that level. You know, I'm better than that. Oh, um, and I wasn't entirely comfortable by doing what I'm doing. You know, I was, it was like, please, no, not again. But hey, bollocks to you, let's go. <laughs> because I, 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 you know, I'm not prepared yeah. to like, say, put my head down. To lie down I mean, I, mean I put it in his context. When I went through Durham once, I was in there strip cell for the full week. And that was after, and I didn't go in there with the intentions of fighting, by the way, Durham. I was just passing through for the weekend. I was going to another establishment. And yeah, they wanted to put me in a cell with another prisoner who was serving two months. I went, I'm not going in there. I said, take me to the, I said, in that spot, I walked to the seg. So I got me pillowcase, made me cussle in a plastic, whatever. And I walked down to the seg and screwed somewhere. I'm going to the seg. And I walked down the steps and they went, right, put me in that cell there, put me in the cell. And I thought, oh, bollocks, so I'll smash the cell up. I went, back, bollocks. So we had it out, et cetera. And yeah, multi team come in. I had no clothes on. Um, got it out, then just got the better of me, carried me up, took me to D-Wing, and it was the old strip cell on the end of D-Wing, <clears throat> and threw me in there, and I was in there a full week, and there was roaches coming under the door at night time. It was freezing, because it was like the outer, outer strip cell, outer wall. And um, from the onset, and them coming with my food, they'll open the door, and they'll go, I'll spit me food. <laughs> Right, and then throw it on the floor. That went on for the full week. Now, bearing in mind that I'm in the body belt, because they put me in the body belt. I've got no clothes on, so I'm defecating and pissing down my legs and shitting anywhere on the floor. So like a straight jacket, basically. Yeah, so, but I still ate my food, because it's the battle of, it's, it's, it's willpower, it's mold survival. I'm showing them, you know, I'm, I'm going to beat you regardless of the circumstance, what you throw against me. Because if I would have given in, they would have all been rubbing their hands, thinking, yeah, looking at soft as shite. It's nothing to do with soft as shite. I'm showing you at the end of the day that I'm prepared to walk the war. And it's simple as that. And you can do what you want to do. Yeah, it's fucking crazy the shit that went on in there. Obviously, strange ways as well. I think the population was 900, but they had nearly 1,700 in the no, prison. No, the population at the time when it kicked off, it was... Um, 1,600, he was 64, 68 prisoners. And he was only designed for 900 prisoners. Yeah, that's crazy. See, when you started the riot, was there a massive plan for that or did it just happen? No, no. I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, it, it, it was sort of like pre-planned to a degree the week leading up to it, you know, but I didn't think nobody had expected going for the length of time it did. The biggest in British history. That, that, that's the thing that stunned everybody. And it went global, the whole world knew about it. Yes. That. Um, and but the reason why it went on that length of time because of the poll tax riots and I firmly believe that because when I was being interviewed I remember turning around to them and said let me tell you something right? you deliberately let this riot continue and they all went what do you mean I said what happened the previous evening down London and they're all scratching their heads thinking what's he on about I said the poll tax riots Trafalgar Square and they said, just by coincidence, that the following morning, one of the biggest prisons 
in this country kicks off just by coincidence. So all the attraction, all the limelight went from that to that. I said, because which is more containable? A riot behind walls or a riot on the streets? So when that happened in the chapel, when the, the riot first started, how many people were in it? Um, I can't give you, you a specific number. I can guess. I'd say around about, about 300 prisoners. Was the beast in there as well? No, no. Now, every Sunday, the beast used to go to that chapel on the right-hand side at the top, mainly from um, C-Wing and E-Wing. Well, on this particular day, he wasn't in attendance. Now, from reading the depositions, I came across a notification that, from a grass, that, to the ward, is like, we're going to kick off in the chapel. So someone stuck you in? Well, didn't stick us in, but but informed that something's going to happen in the chapel and it's going to kick off. So what's happened, the wardens have gone to the sex offence saying, you're not going to the chapel today. You know, we can't go because it's going to be trouble. Some of the sex offence saying, I want to go to the chapel, and they're saying, well, you're not going. But what they've done, the ones on sea wing, right, as soon as it kicked off in the chapel, they got rid of them, got them out of the building immediately. But the ones on the E wing on the, on the falls... How many of them was there? <clears throat> The ones on the evening were about 54 or 56, they were. The scary thing is, if they kept in there, they'd have probably all been dead. They were kept in, the ones on the E-Wing. Oh, E-Wing? Yeah, E-Wing. So the ones that were in the chapel got out? Right. No, they, they weren't in attendance. Right, because They were confined behind gave, themselves. Yeah, the five. ones on the wing no sex offenders went to the chapel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me get this straight. No sex offenders were in attendance because of the, 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 the warning that they so had the notified grass. that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So the ones on seeming, as soon as it kicked off in the chapel, they got rid of them out the, the building. The back door. But the ones on E-Wing, they left them. Now, I'm feeling really they left them to the fate, not that I'm bothered. The sex offenders. So as a result, when it kicked off and they got the keys and doors were being opened, the sex offenders on E-Wing were all being battered. The cell doors were being wrenched off, whatever. You know, and items were taking place, retribution for the crimes they were in for. You know, um, not that I feel sorry. Was you know, two people lost their lives during this Right, riot? two people lost their lives, right? Was that sex offenders? Right. One was a sex offender called Derek White. Um, multiple, multiple forms of, um, how can I put it, rape against children. Now, the reason why I say that, because I had access to their um, antecedents, all of them. I want to know them, they're giving, they're giving everything to you. I want to know them all, right? So it wasn't a pretty thing. So the Jews have everybody's files and... Yeah, uh -huh. basically the files, but the police have an antecedent on you. So if I'm a solicitor, I ask for it and it'll give me a rundown of what you've been in prison, what right. you've been um, charged with the throughout the years. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And multiple times it went on and it went on and went on the list, you know? Um, so we got a good hiding as a result of what he was in prison for now. Um, I didn't touch no sex offender. I wasn't interested in them, you know. But unfortunately, I was charged with his death. You charged with another murder? I was charged with his death. Mm -hmm. That Derek White sex yeah. offender. He, char he died with, um, from natural causes, from a blood clot behind his left knee. Um, but he did get a good hiding. But it was another prisoner that accused me Attacking him, saying that they see me attacking him, and took his eye out, his eyes were in and all that. So that's how much bullshit was going on. Um, but luckily for me, a QC did a third autopsy on him, independent autopsy, and found the blood clot that killed him. And that's how he died, and all charges were dismissed. The other person that died was a screw, but he died from an actual cause of heart, heart attack. Through you know, the riots? Yeah. You know, uh, not because of anybody, anybody third hand, just a natural cause of heart attack. See, because of the beatings the screws put out in you, see if they did die by getting a beating from the cons, would they have mattered? Um, more revenge, more... Obviously... From the screws? Yeah. If they, I, I knew that the screws, eventually when the lads were going out, my vents got up, my, myself got apprehended that they couldn't go over the top with the beatings. Because it had now it'd been gone on that many days, it was under the microscope. Because it changed the whole system that you'd done. Absolutely. You, you were the main negotiator. You yes. had to go and negotiate stuff. When did you start 
realizing how big it got? How many days into the from the onset? From straight away. From the onset, because obviously we took discussion had taken place conservatively. Mm-hmm. Um um, it was about the disconsent within the prison system, strange ways, but the prison system on the whole, you know, um, and that the message, has, the message has to be put out that this type of behaviour, these type of conditions cannot continue, you know, not in this day and age. What were you negotiating the first time you went down? Um, basically, it was about, well, the first time we went down, our concerns was about prisoners, you know, if prisoners are going to come out willingly, which they mm-hmm. have the entitlement to do so, and that they're not going to be touched. We want that um, security and assurity, right? Or surety, I should say, for somebody else, because somebody uh. criticised me about using the word assurity, <laughs> but they got it wrong. <laughs> um, that was our main concerns. Although, although the undercurrent was about the rights of conditions, screws behaviour, Etc. Their concerns was about, about the YPs, the young prisoners. Now, I understand that because there were young lads just caught up in it, hyped up in it, egos, you know. Story to tell their friends yeah, when they get out. Precisely. Eventually, when it all quells down, if they're still there, reality might sit in for some of them. They think, bloody hell, I want to go now. Especially people, was it all LTPs? Was it all long-term prisoners? Or was there people doing one year, two year? That it was put, a mixture. So people could have potentially got more onto their sentence? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How were you feeling getting down for the first time to negotiate? You're not thinking, oh, they're going to fucking jump me here? Yeah, of course it did. So why did you, why? Was that again you? Right, right. Uh, again, you got, you got to understand, sorry. You got to understand that it's an incident, right? And in any given incident, you got to have negotiations. And the reason why I say that, because if, if nobody went down to negotiate and they, and they all just got fobbed off, it would have all been for nothing. The press would have had a field day. Look at these idiots. They don't even know why they're writing. They're just writing for the namesake. And I didn't want to distract from the point that it was about the conditions, the inhumane conditions and the injustice of how people are treated. This is what it was about. Um, and how can I put it? That was carried forward all the way through by myself, regardless. And as you know, a result of that, that the Wolf Inquiry came into play right near the end. Mm-hmm. Um, and hence, it, it, it did radicalise the old system for the better. So once you were doing the riots, the police, they cut off all electricity? Yeah, everything. Why, they were playing music outside? Yeah, outside from the onset. What um, the fuck was all that about? That was to stop people conversing with the press across the way. Or for giving information? Yeah. On South Hall Street, there's warehouses, retail warehouses. Mm-hmm. And then um, they were all on top of the roofs there. Um, Mary Monson Solicitors had one of these re- retail warehouses, but it was a solicitors firm, coincidentally, facing um, the old gatehouse. Mm-hmm. So a lot of press was on there. Um, so they didn't want prisoners and press con- conversing, exchanging what it was about. So they drowned them out with music or blaring of the horns. Oh, and I, I, I was calling across a couple of times, but it can be a bit heavy on that. So what about, in the yeah, what about <laughs> food then? How was your supplies? Food. Right, let me tell you about food. I mean, there was, plenty, there was plenty of food in the kitchen, tin stuff, plenty. For how long do you think that could have lasted for? That could have lasted for quite a while in actual fact. Mm. You know, um, when you have all the other stuff like frozen stuff like meat, eggs, etc., things like that, you have to be a bit more precautious with it because mm, salmonella, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Food poisoning yeah, and stuff. Yeah, it all yeah. comes into play. And, and two, one of the lads did get um, salmonella poison on the 10th. Fuck's you know, seeing him being stretched out. But yeah. that's because he opened the tin of corned beef, left it, and then went back to it a couple of days later. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> Um, but we had plenty of supplies there also from the canteen what was left and um, rounded them up and for the first week I must admit for the first week and my first time into that kitchen I found all the steaks and chops and I'm talking about (sighs) multiple tubes of meat meat I've never seen in my life but meat that we don't get while you're in there and that's all I lived on, plus other lads, for the full week, steak and chops. 
you know. Um, <laughs> and I loved it. <laughs> Obviously, when you did the riots, because they had put you through the racial abuse, ab- racial abuse, the physical abuse, to take over a prison, that is the worst thing you can do to the governor, to the, co- the screws. For you, how were you feeling as if to say, fuck you, two's up, I've eventually won this fight? Yeah, of course. I mean, you do get, you do get a buzz about it. Yeah. You know, because, to put it in its context, all them prisoners from the onset, it must have been a vestige of freedom. Because you had pent up frustration, that anger, that annoyance being locked in your cell all day. You know, all you're seeing is <clears throat> locks, bolts, bars and mortar. That's all you're seeing. Now you, now you can go anywhere you want in the building, you can go on the roof, see the world. You know? <laughs> Yeah. So that that it's like letting a, it's like letting our little dog out into the back garden. There, he loves it. Oh yeah, that's what we're like. Um, but that was short lived because it still comes down to what's it about? You know, you can you can you can frolic about much as you want, but you can't distract from what the incident's oh, yeah. about. You need an end product. Yeah, which is and to, to create that, change. Yeah, the thing that I found sad about it on the first day and the second day. I'm talking about the evening, is that, you know, the canteen had been raided, you know, the, the, the healthcare medical um, centre on the wing where they distributed medication had been raided, you know. Um, People full of methadone and sleeping tablets. And oh, I don't know what, don't, yeah. all sorts. Um, but the thing, that, the thing that astounded me and sort of like irated me, irated me was that the lads in the evening were throwing all the all the all the stuff from the canteen which they felt they didn't want over the landing and i thought what are you doing yeah you need this supplies. Is stuff you don't even get now yeah. you now you you know you're disregarding it as you used to say i don't need that now so that's why hence me a couple and myself and a couple of us went to the canteen and rounded the rest of the stock and went no we need this so when did you start getting your add-ons in for sentences was that did you get ever get an extra sentence for the riot? I, I got 10 years. Did they throw 10 years onto 10 that? 10 years I got, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and the reason why I say 10 years, right, is because up until that point, you know, nobody been done for riot throughout history. You look at history, you have to be done collectively. Um, but nobody has. And it was being portrayed in the papers that um, by the POA members that these 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 and fellas should get 10 years. Did they not say there was 20 body bags went in straight away the first day they thought there were no, 20 deaths? No, nonsense, nonsense. I mean, couples were quite angry about that because that was portrayed by the, 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 the press, the mainstream press, and that was far from the truth. Because you made it clear you never throw any bricks, you never set anything on fire, you no, never harmed anybody. No, so why did thing, you get the biggest one in the biggest the only, senses? The only thing I done, which I can hold my hands up to, believe it or not, was knocking the uh, main partition wall down on the roof. Uh-huh. You know, with the um, a mullet hammer. I was knocking it down. And the reason why I knocked that down so I could walk up and down it for safety purposes. Um, and that was my reason. But as for throwing any missile, no. I wasn't foolish enough to do that because I know the minute I'd done that, they got me. Even though they got me anyway. <laughs> but they got me more yeah. so now. Mm-hmm. Because he would have been classified as a, a, a lethal weapon, mm-hmm. you know, and being a life sentence prisoner, uh, that has repercussions, serious repercussions. So how did you get caught then once the riots were coming to an right, end? Right, um, I got apprehended, right, and, you know, my own fault, I became complacent. And what happened, as the days are going on, I went down on several occasions to negotiate with um, POA members. And um, on this particular day, the sun come out. <clears throat> so I was just soaking up the sun, the rays. And it was John Joel. He popped his head up and he said, Alan, do you want to talk to you downstairs? Well, I said, OK, I'll be down in a minute. But I didn't want to go down. But I thought, well, I have to go down. Um, <clears throat> so as I'm going work, working my way down, he clearly shouts, be careful, lad, because I don't fucking trust him. So I've climbed all the way down because everything was a wrecking side. I mean, it was all Victorian in jail, so all the staircases, etc., were made of cast iron, all gone, all smashed. So I've jumped down onto E-Wing, the bottom, 
and the old hospital complex was under the spinal staircase. I've gone to the gate and there was two warders from there. One was called Tate and one was called Jones. Tate was from Hull, Jones was from Manchester. Um, we did a little exchange and then all of a sudden he did something with his body. Momentarily, and I, but I clocked it and I thought, oh. And as I backed away from the gate, all the cell doors, all the way, the full length of the landing, even behind me, opened and all the right squads come out. So I know my way back up was... Gone? Yeah, it's gone. No chance. Did you not notice that going down the way? No, my thought, the reason why I said that, I became complacent because when I've dropped down <clears throat> upon reflection, I should have seen that all the debris on the landing had been moved away and I didn't. If I'd have seen that, there's no way I'd have come down. Uh -huh. I would have went, no. Mm -hmm. But it's obviously, they went on a month. Were you probably glad at the end that it, it's kind of come, it came to a head? How long do you think it could have went on for? Um, but to be perfectly honest, right, and a lot of people are aware of this, that during the times I negotiated with the POA members, they used to ask me when I'm coming out from the onset. And I clearly stated, I'm not coming out. You're going to have to come in and get me. They always let me back in. Why is that? Um, think I think it may be based on the fact that they had to have somebody that they could negotiate with. Fairly. On good faith, yeah. Um, somebody was a bit more sensible in that respect. Not, not like hot-headed. Um, and I also firmly believe that <clears throat> if they wouldn't have me from the onset, then that would have given... Kick clear off. evidence to others that we're not going to negotiate with yeah. use. More, more of a danger, more of a risk. Of course. Yeah. But let's not kid ourselves. Even though we're negotiating, we're still at loggerheads with each other. I don't trust you and you don't trust me in reality. Yeah. You know, but somewhere along the line, we, we have to show faith. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's based on falseness. Yeah. So you've had a couple of... <laughs> yeah, mate, your story's unreal, if I'm honest, mate. I've done over 60 podcasts. This is up there with one of the best, but the story-wise, obviously, it's sad as well, but it's um, it's a... The story's unbelievable, mate. Mm. Obviously, we're trying to make, you're trying to make it into a film as well, which we will get do, um, which you will do eventually. You've touched it into a book, because you had a couple of escapes also. Yes. Um, how did that come about, the first one? Um, right, the, well... The Was that before the riots or after? Um, that was that was during um, one of the trials, right. believe it or not. Um, and no, that, that was before my trial. Sorry, I kept myself from mixing up with the second one. And what happened? They dispersed me to um, the police station in Bolton called Astley Bridge Police Station. And they put me in a single cell on my own on the ladies' side. Moved all the ladies out, um, but all the men went on the other side. <clears throat> Um, but every morning they used to take me all the way around past the sergeant's desk to get a shower. Now, a lot of people have to understand this. And I'll try and paint the picture for you. There's two sets of keys in the containment down below. Um, you have a bunch, I have a bunch. <clears throat> We're not allowed outside that floor. We're there to look after the prisoners, do whatever we have to do down below. Whilst you took me from my shower, the other officer, police officer, is searching my cell, doing whatever he's doing with other prisoners, but I know he's searching my cell because he used to leave things in a certain way. And when I come back, they've been disturbed. And on this particular morning, I've come back. And bearing in mind that, to get to that shower, I've had to go from my cell door, through one gate, through two gates, walk past the sergeant's desk, through another two gates. Now I've come back, escorted back, the same way. When he's unlocked my cell door, I walked in, and the window cell was directly in front of me. And on the window cell was a bunch of keys. What bunch of keys, I don't know at that specific moment, but I know it's a bunch of keys. And as I've gone in, he's closing the door. He said, um, you got everything now, Mr. Lord? I went, yeah, fine, thank you. And he shut the door. <clears throat> well, as soon as he shut that door, I grabbed the keys. And 
I hid the keys under the toilet, put my hand in, and then there was a little shelf at the back, right at the top of it, and I got him in. Went right. But what I was expecting during the changeover at four o'clock, shift on, shift off, was the biggest commotion in the world. <laughs> and it was nothing, it was definitely quiet. And I thought, hmm, maybe half an hour later, half four, they will. No, five o'clock, they will. No, nothing. I was expecting that police station to be locked down and turned over. I was expecting Keystone cops to come running out of cell and rip it to shreds. Nothing. Um, which was surprising. Yeah, really? Because what crossed my mind, I thought, how did you two go off duty, hand over your bunch of keys for the next two that are coming on? I firmly believe it was a settle. No doubt about it. I was I firmly believe that they was expecting me to be brash about it. Go that evening, but they were standing off waiting so they could do what they had to do with Definitely me. Yeah, beaten. I won't necessarily say beat, I say possibly Kill you. take me out of the equation completely, yeah. yeah. And the reason why I say that, <clears throat> because up to the point I got apprehended on the first escape. I got feedback from a friend of mine in Newcastle when they raided the house that one of the teams said, as soon as we get him, we're going to fucking waste him. Yeah, because you became such a Yushans. Yes. Um, but I had them keys for five weeks. Five weeks in that cell. And luckily for me, the World Cup was on. So their interest was more in the World Cup, what teams were, were, were playing. And from the onset I entered that police station, they used to leave my hatch down. They used to come check me every 15 minutes, then it went to 20, half an hour, three quarters of an hour, and later and later. Um, <clears throat> but when the World Cup started, it, it got even less. Yeah. When I had the bunch of keys, like I said, I didn't know what they were for, but when I knew they were watching whatever, I started coming out the cell. Open my cell door, <laughs> close it behind. I know it sounds, it sounds it doesn't yeah. sound real, but yeah. it is. And one person seemed to comment said, I can't see him, how can, how can he have the bunch of keys? He would, have, he would have killed everybody in the police station. I would have killed everybody in the police station. Yeah. My intent would have been to escape, not go around committing mayhem in the police station. But the mere fact they did leave the bunch of keys. And um, he opened my cell door, one key opened the gates. But that's far as I got. Um, I was a bit concerned about that because I thought, well, I've got these, but here's the main door now to go on to the front of the building. And that was, that was adjacent to where they bring in the visitors to go into the, the, partition, the um, partition room for the visitors. And um, on the day I went, it was a Sunday. I went, right, I'm going, that's it. It was early hours in the morning, in other words. And... Um, I had my own clothes then, by the way. I had a sleeping bag. I puffed it up like I was asleep. I left the book at the <laughs> side, yeah. And left everything in that cell as it was. Mm -hmm. And um, went through the gate, went through the gate. And the side where I used to go in for my, for my visit, I went behind the door. And by going behind the door, looking through it, I could see behind the sergeant's desk, them watching the television. And if I come from behind the door and look down to my left, we'll see them watching television in the office down there. But the door adjacent to the, where the visit is coming to go into, from that door into that door to talk to me for the glass, that was the main door. And it was just by coincidence, believe it or not, there was a buzz and the back doors would open. And this is where they bring in the uh, detainees and don't need to brought in, but I remember clearly it was a WPC. And she clearly said to the sergeant, yeah, she's, can you buzz me through? And that was the door there. And I thought, right, but I'm behind the door here now. And the door's there. And I thought, right. And as he buzzed her through, I come from behind the door. And just as the door was about to shut, I put my two fingers on it and stops it from closing too. And I went through into it and I was like in the foyer. And there was a door in front, a door to the left, a door to the right, and a door behind that had just come in. I went straight over to the door in front, and there was a glass in it. And I looked through, and it was back of the, um, back of the police station, at, um, resting area, canteen, etc. But I could see the glass leading to the outside world. 
And on my left hand side, the door in there, there was power points. But the door on the right had a metal plate. So I presume that was the front of the police station where they bring in the visitors. So I thought, what am I going to do here? I'm stuck in here. Was there no cameras or fuck all? Nothing? No. Fuck's sake. So, so I'm panicking a bit, but I'm not panicking. And I've looked through the door again, the glass, and I see the WPC coming back. So I've gone in the door on the left-hand side with the power points. Got behind the door, and I'm behind the door, but this door now is, is sort of like in front of me, but more to me right. She's come through, and just as she's passed, I come from behind the door, and again, put my fingers on it, stop it closing too. And she's just, just there behind me, just matter of feet. If she would have turned around, she would have seen me, but she didn't turn around. So, no, soon as she's gone through that door, I've gone through that door. And now I'm in their area. <clears throat> I went straight over to the fridge, drank their milk. <laughs> just thought, oh, first I'm drinking your milk. <laughs> and it was time to go. But just as I was going towards the back of the exit, I seen a door on the right. And there was a book there. And that, that was their book signing in and signing out. And I was going to book, put in it, Lord signing off. But I thought, no, leave it. And went out the back door. Um, I remember running down back of the path, crossing the road, going into the field, <clears throat> and I stood in the field, and I had the two keys on me, like that, had a bunch of keys, and I remember throwing them in there and I shouted freedom, but I didn't have a clue where I was going, <laughs> to tell you the truth, you know, yeah. I was like an headless chicken, I thought, yeah. where do I go? Uh -huh. I know I was in Bolton, but I've never been Bolton for in my life, and I just thought, just, just play it by chance, just go for it. And I took off. <clears throat> and I remember I ran across the field. Eventually I come to a, a high wall, climbed that, scaled it. <clears throat> went through a graveyard, scaled another wall, went down the embankment and come across the stream. Went across the stream, fell into it, but just laughed it off. Went up another embankment and ended up on the railway tracks. And I thought, which way do I go? Do I go left or do I go right? Instinct just went, just go, left. And I ran all the way from Bolton all the way down to Southport on the tracks. And that was that, you free man. How long were you on the run for? Um, four days in total. And how was that feeling for you? It's, how can I put it? It's like a weight lifted off you. It's cat and mouse, cloak and dagger stuff now in reality. Because I know at the end of the day that they've got all their resources out looking for me. You know, um, be all over the news, the papers. I'm all over the news, spread over the front pages, etc. And I'm, uh, but that wasn't my concern. My concern was trying to keep me head low. I was in a couple of safe houses, but I wasn't entirely happy. You know, I remember one once one of us in, and the helicopters over and above, and a panic. And I thought, no, that's watching this house. Maybe not watching anything. Just my paranoia. But I remember saying to you know the bloke who had me, I said, you need to transfer me out. I think that helicopter's on me. You know, nonsense, but, um, but eventually I was placed in another safe house and I see the contact was made with this person who had a 40 foot cruiser. I see I got all my finances, all my funds together, etc. cetera. Um, what was your plan to get out of the country? To get out of the country, absolutely. You know, there's, there's, there's no way I could remain in this country. No, because I would have to remain underground forever. Um, and the person that had the, not finances, but had the, the, the necessity to get me out of the country via boat, um, they went and picked it up. 18 men went to pick it up. Sensible people, not, not, not nonsense, sensible people. When I met her in Manchester, uh, just didn't bring her back straight away. Did a couple of reconnaissance around the streets, make sure I'm not being followed at land or air. <clears throat> Eventually, when they got back to Liverpool, did the same again. When they thought everything was all right, they dispersed and brought it to the house. I was leaving this country, or made my way to the port at 5 to 11. And I sat there just on a general chit chat. And I remember saying to the proprietor of the house, what mentioned his name, I said, I'll be gone soon. He said, well, I'm going out, you won't be here anyway. I said, all right, thank you very much. All provisions were put in the car. And 5 to 11, I heard the helicopter. And you know when you just know? 
And I thought, that's low, that's fast, that's coming here. <laughs> and no soon as these thoughts crossed my mind, it was above the house. Boom, 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 boom. And no soon as that was above the house, I'm up anyway. I'm making my way to the back door. Because as I said to him, if he comes on top, I'm going through your window. He said, do what you want to do, Al. Um, I was up. I dived through the back window. Didn't open the door. Just dived through the back window. Even a bit of frame come out. Um, hit the back yard. I was conscious of glass, though, to be perfectly you honest. You cut yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I did cut myself eventually anyway. And um, I ran to the back of the yard to scale the wall. But now, it's right above me. The helicopter would be Yeah, you basically searchlight. fucked your feet. I lost Yeah, yeah. There. Well, yes and no. Yes and no, because it was like a bit of theatrical play, to be honest. You know, like all sorts of happening here. Generally going, <laughs> you know, determinations going. And I remember I ran to the right-hand side of the wall. And I scaled it. And it was all plain clothes and... and uniformed in the backyard, one ran at me. It looked like a pickaxe handle, you ask me. So I dropped down again. I went to the left-hand side of the wall, but I was expecting it now. So I've scaled it fast as I can, and a, a joint to the left-hand side of the wall is a coal bunker. So as I scaled the wall, I hit the top of the coal bunker and all, I got on top of that. Now I'm stood on top of it. All coppers there, 64, 65 coppers around that house. Armed response? Armed response were there, yeah. You're not shining yourself in case they popped you? No, no, because I knew people across the way. Watching? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you call it? They were all at the window behind me, just about the feet, at the window. And one climbed on the wall on the right side, plain clothes, but he had the side, side arm. And he went, come on, Lord, give yourself up. And I went, fuck off, you bunch of bastards. <laughs> And I ran across the left-hand side of the top wall, ran across it, and I launched myself from that top wall over the alleyway onto the next house and come, dropped into their backyard, and then I was off through the windows. And I went through six houses like that, through the back window, <laughs> frame everything. <laughs> the and glass. I, and I, I'll be perfectly honest, you know. You're lucky you survived that and never cut any arteries or... Well, I cut my legs. I got, I got loads of keloids on my legs. Were you scraping the glass, yeah, yeah, as I'm going through. Um, well, I did feel it at the time, to be honest, because adrenaline was pumping. Um, but what, what surprised me was the height of the ledges. Didn't think that I was that high. Oh, the hell. Well, um, I was quite shocked in actual fact, but because adrenaline was gone, I just went for it. Yeah. And the first house that I went through, I remember hitting a table, crashed on the table, and he was a bloke, and he sort of like went back in his chair... And the ladies are like, Ooh. but I didn't stop. It, I, it was, the momentum kept me going forward. I found the front door, even though I've never been in their house. And rather than open the front door, I would have been a simple task. I went smashing right through the old glass frame, everything. And I ran across the street and I did exactly the same to the other four houses. Just kept going, five houses kept going. Do you think somebody stuck you in? For your, your safe right, house. Right, I come to that. Well, the person who had the bolt, we reckon she had a tracker on her. Oh, you're just, mm. yeah. Yeah, because to, to know you're there is obviously something. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, where did you go when you get captured then? Um, they took me to a police station in Liverpool. Um, what police station? I don't know, to be perfectly honest. I just know it was a police station. Did you get took to hospital or anything for your cuts? <laughs> They wanted to um, examine me cuts in the police station, but I fucked them off and went, just go away. <laughs> it wasn't interesting, you know what I mean? Because um, that was me being contumacious. That means rebellious against authority. Um, and I didn't want didn't want them to see that. I want anything from you. I don't want to need nothing from you. Go away. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> kept me there overnight and then moved back to the um, prison system the following day. Strange ways? No, this time they took me to um, Wakefield. When did you start then trying to screw the nut and going, right, I don't want to fight a lost cause, I don't want to die in here? Was there a point it turns your life around and says, was there a catalyst to go, right, I'm going to try and get myself head clear and get out, I want out of here? Absolutely. I mean, don't get me wrong, even though I turned, and I had this argument, because we'd go out the probation service because I had to do a little conference in front of them. And I said, when you've been treating such a manner, you, you know, you turn animalistic. She said, I don't agree with that turn that you actually that. I said, well, you can't comprehend it until you're in my shoes. Yeah. 
you know, but you do turn animalistic. But at the same time, when you have your moments where there's no confrontation, everything's quelled down. Don't get me wrong, I had my points, I had my moments where I was in certain prisons where I was getting on with it. But for whatever period, it was short-lived, it was long-lived, whatever. Um, and sometimes you do think, bloody hell, I can do without this again. Yeah. But, but your pride gets the better of you. Your determination, you, you know, your principles, your values, you think, no, I'm not having it. You know, because, he, 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 you know. Was there a time you, you would have died in there then? I firmly believed it. I firmly believed it. Does that not it's, scare you though, thinking back? It, think. it, it, no, it doesn't scare me, no. I mean, to tell you the truth, right, nobody likes to die. But uh, as I keep saying to um, Nita, you know, my body would die, I die. <laughs> you know? And the reason why I say that, because I, I had a good friend in Liverpool and he developed a tumour behind his eye. And he's in his 70s. And as he said, Alan, I don't care. I've had a good life, I'm happy, and that's all that matters. Yeah, death smiles and, to us all, only thing we can do yeah, is smile Yeah, absolutely, back. it comes eventually to yeah, us all, so, yeah. you know, just take it on the chin. Mm -hmm. People do feel sorry for them, like young kids, you know, get cancer and things yeah, like that. Course, yeah, absolutely, course. never had a chance in life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, there's moments it did cross my mind, but at the end of the day, I knew I had to change tactics, because I thought, I'm creating my own calamity here to a degree. I'm giving what they want, even though they're precipitating my behavior, which they are. Yeah. You know, they're antagonizing me, they're being racial abusive in certain establishments. I'm not gonna sit back and take it on the chin. But then it comes to a point, okay, if I keep doing this, I'm staying in here, and then they will eventually win. They won, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the last time I had a confrontation with him was uh, 1997, Long Larson. 20 years ago. Yeah, Long Larson that was. Uh, went to Long Larson, didn't like Long Larson from the onset. Didn't like it. Scruffy establishment. We were mixed with the um, sex offenders from F Wing, you know, um, which I didn't agree with, and that annoyed me. Because um, just certain people in there, you know, give it all the large, and yeah, you know, you're talking to him, what you're talking to him for? Um, but I wouldn't comply. You know, they wanted to bang prisons up in the day, etc. And I'll be free. I said, I'm not banging up the day, I've been banged up all night. <laughs> you know, I had arguments with the PIs, they wouldn't let me in the gym do any training. <clears throat> and then on this particular day, um, the CNR team come from with the right squad. And uh, most, more or less, said, you going? I said, right, let's go. Got escorted to the seg, <clears throat> outnumbered. It was like cockroaches in their nest. Um, and I said, well, what's the reason for being shipped out? He said, um, due to other prisoners' behaviour. In other words, I'm influencing other prisoners. In what, in what manner am I influencing other prisoners? I, do, I make my own respective decisions here, do my own thing. Um, so I remember I took my clothes off and there was a prison green blanket there and I, I made it all in it, put it on me like a poncho, like Clint Eastwood, <laughs> you know. Um, and then what happened, you know, as soon as I put that on, this was the naughty part, as soon as I put on, they put the ankles on me, put them on tight, and then they walked me to the van. And I thought, I bollocks to this. As soon as I got in the van, I closed the van door behind me, locked it, and I smashed everything in that van. Seats a lot. No, it took me a while, but I done it because it was hurting with the ratchets on. You know, and I done it. And there's more seeing our coming round the van, they're bringing the dogs, they're bringing governors, border visitors, you know, I presume doctors, the, the, the medical nursing staff were all there. <clears throat> um, and eventually, they, they made a pathway, two lines, from the building to the van door. And walked up to one of the CNR and he got on the little step that you get into get into the van and he said, Right, Lord, we're going to open this door. If you thought, was a, thought with us, we'll set the dog in you. I said, Do what you want to do. Um, unlocked the door, backed off. <clears throat> I've opened the door myself. <laughs> I jumped down and nobody ran at me. And I walked along the path, but you could cut the atmosphere. Yeah, it was like holding a load of pit bulls back, wasn't it? And um, next minute, Walks into the building itself. No sooner as I got in the building, it was all over me. Yeah, all over me, bouncing all over me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one particular one was trying to, I know he's trying to break my wrist, you know, bend it back far as he can. Don't get me wrong, get hurt. But again, you don't show it to them that it hurts. And then after whatever period, they dragged me to the strip cell, threw me in there. And I was in there for about, let's say, half an hour, three quarters of an hour. Then the door opened again, <clears throat> and um, 
since you've been moved now. Um, and I remember clearly saying to him, as, and I looked to me left and I seen the camera looking at that strip cell door. I said, oh, your brutality, I'll be on camera. He said, oh, not me. Well, in the fact, they've all got these visors on, helmets, with a mask right, on, yeah. so you can't tell them anyway. Yeah. And there was a board of visitors there, a woman, and I'm not sure to say it, but I'll say it. I said, I said, see you, you bitch, I'll have you in court and all. She sort of smirked. And as, as I've entered the building to get into the van, the governor was there. And I, said, I remember saying to him, I said, see you. I said, I'll have you up in court and all. And he laughed. And next minute, also he said that, they grabbed me again and they tied my feet up and then put me in the van, in the box. So I managed to put me on the floor, but I managed to slide myself up, so to speak. <clears throat> and um, off we were to Woodhill. And unbeknown to me at that time, the CNR team, the right squad team, followed the van down from Long Larton. You know, unbeknown, the pra the, that practice is very unethical because I've never known them to follow a van down to another prison if you're being ghosted. Mm -hmm. It's up to the other prison to give you the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. But they didn't. Don't want to take that risk. Could be a possibility, but I think it was antagonism. Because as soon as we pull up in Woodhill, I see all the CNR going past. So I remember saying to him, ah, like that is it. Right, we'll fucking sort this out then. And van door's open. As soon as it's open, they grab hold of me. Drag me into the strip cell, in, bang. But he can't do nothing. And just close the door. And I'm kicking the door now because they, they took that off my leg. But they've left them on kicking the door. And I'm shouting, you know, like, open this door, let's have it. The lot of you's. And I, I, I give due respect the way it's due. The governor come to me do, to the door from that establishment. And he said, Lordy, I don't know what the fuck's going on. So I knew he was genuine, because even he's like, what's going on here? This is my prison. And I must admit that Woodhill was all right with me. Yeah. Left me be. Mm -hmm. So I commented at the latter stages here, like 20 odd years in prison. Did you get, ever get a release date? No. No? No, always so, got knocked back. Yeah. Always got knocked back. I wasn't it? expecting nothing. So was eventually it? after the 32 years when you got how was that feeling when you're eventually um, getting released? I didn't show no reaction, to tell you the truth. Just you blank? Were you just shocked? Blanking. No, I wasn't shocked. <clears throat> I didn't show any emotion, to be honest. I didn't, I didn't gloat about it. I didn't laugh about it. <clears throat> I didn't smirk about it. I didn't think I got one over you. I just looked at, looked at them to think. Mm. How was it standing outside the prison for the first time in 32 years? Free man. That was good. That was good because I know now I was... I was I was, I wasn't confined. That's the difference. Caged animal. Yeah, I knew that. I'm walk. There's only one way I'm going down that road, you know. Um, but I was shocked that I got parole, you know. But I only got parole. And even though I changed tactics, don't get me wrong. Let's put this in context. Even though I changed tactics in 1997 from fisty cuffs to pen on paper. And I did not believe for one moment that the pen was mighty in the sword until I took it up. Yeah. And it didn't get me out immediately. You know, I still served years on top. But what it did do for me, it gave me the capacity to take up issues with the prison system in the right way. More political. More political, yes. Yeah. So if you didn't do that, there's a good chance you'd probably still be in. I'd have still been in. Yeah. No doubt about it. Did you educate yourself well then in there to obviously try and beat the system through brains instead of muscle? Both combined together. Yeah. You can't have one without the other. It's, it's all right saying that, you know, you can educate yourself, keep your, keep your faculties there, you know, but you have to keep both faculties there, mental and physical, because, because it's all right saying, you know, I've kept my mental faculties there, but my body's gone. Yeah. But it's great, as soon as you came out, you opened up your gym and now you help other people also. It's great the fact that you've stayed on the straight and narrow, which is seven years in December. Is that correct? Yes. You've wrote your book. Where's that piece of paper, Steph? Um, which we'll touch on. We'll show people the link and stuff. This is your book here. Um, Life in Strange Ways. What was the bit at the bottom? Life in Strange Ways. Uh, my 32 years behind bars from riot to redemption. Mm -hmm. Which is a great, it's great 
words by the way um, yeah. I've not read the book yet but I'm going to get into about it I just got it in Kindle last right. night so where can people buy this book um, you can get the book on Amazon mm-hmm. um, Kindle W. H. Smith or Walton Stones which we'll leave the links so you're trying to t- the, the stories I've had many people on this podcast but this is up there with the one of the best your story's unbelievable I've got to know you quite well you're a very honest man which is, takes a lot of respect yes, as well thanks. especially through the stuff you've been through so now you're trying to make the book into a film which I believe would be massive and fingers crossed that happens sooner yeah. rather than later so from now moving forward for the future with yourself Alan what's the plans and the plan is at the moment just stay out enjoy my life <laughs> you know what I mean that's <laughs> basically uh, just enjoy my life uh-huh. I mean whatever lifespan I have remaining I, I intend to enjoy it yeah um, and the main fact, even if I didn't have these own comforts, which I have, um, I still enjoy my life because I'd rather be out here with nothing than being there. Yeah. And that is the difference. That's what separates it from being normal. You know, the way I behaved in, behaved in there was a necessity. I don't have to behave like that out here now. You know, I'm being treated how I should be treated as a human being, yeah. you mainly civil. Yeah. So you, 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 you portray that back, you convey it back, you know? And this is what I used to say to psychologists inside there. How you treat me, right? I'll treat you the same. And how you, how could I put it? One psychologist said to me that, why do you behave the way you behave? I said, because the system treats me in such a way she said but that doesn't make you behave that way I said of course it does I said there's no other way and she gave me an analogy and the analogy being is if I'm in the seg and I go for my breakfast that morning and the screws are all laughing and smirking and when they have me plate I've only got half a sausage half an egg half a bacon do I continue with that and go back to my cell don't feel well that the next morning it may be a quarter of that half I'll do a nip it in the bud. I nip it in the bud because I know the end of the day by nipping that in the bud, it's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of showing them that if I nip it in the bud, you won't do that the next morning because you won't want the sassel every morning. So do you think if you get treated better by the screws, you wouldn't have done half the stuff that you had done to fight back and make an example? Correct. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great. That that is the beauty of life, Alan. No matter what you've done, we've all made mistakes. Some people make mistakes worse than others, but the beauty of life is people can change. You can change your path in life. You can learn from your mistakes. You can speak to other kids who maybe go to prison and jails to tell them to not do the same mistakes that you did. No. Which is a no. beautiful thing because you can also, yes, you've the 32 years is a long time, but you can also save kids for doing the same mistakes. So you're also saving lives, which is a, a again, it's a powerful thing. You've got a lot of respect. You're very yes. well respected. Your book's out. And for me, coming into your house and hearing your stories has been unbelievable mate and I really, really, I really appreciate Oops. it thank you um, very much and all the best for the future Alan. you too thank you very much thank you. thank you